introduction to the latest developments in epilepsy. My colleagues will, will expand on some of the points I'm going to make uh, and also a glimpse into the near future uh, in, in epilepsy. But if we, it's always important to sort of ground ourselves and, uh, okay, it's obvious that everybody in this room knows what epilepsy is, uh, but let's just um, define it again in a little bit more detail. Uh, it's not just recurrent unprovoked seizures. So epilepsy, or the epilepsies, uh, define a group of brain disorders or neurological conditions, a group of conditions, not one condition, affecting individuals of all ages, um, and frustratingly, uh, of varying cause, but frustra frustratingly, more often than not, would you believe it or not, uh, of unknown cause in an individual presenting with epilepsy. Characterized clinically by recurrent unprovoked seizures, more than one seizure generally occurring out of nowhere, uh, although there can be triggers, as, as, as you all know, uh, are now also, we, epilepsy can be defined, or the epilepsies can be defined as uh, occurring in an individual with one unprovoked seizure, but with a, quote, enduring predisposition, unquote, to further seizures. What do we mean by an enduring predisposition? So we mean uh, somebody presents with one seizure, and they have uh, particular abnormalities on their brainwave test, their EEG, or, or a particular abnormality on their scan that leads us as clinicians to believe that they're at higher risk for further seizures. So those individuals can be conceptualized now as having epilepsy as well, and then we make a decision about starting treatment in, in that context. Um, the other interesting thing that we think about more and more in, in the epilepsies is that uh, if an individual presents with their seemingly for seizure, let's say their convulsion to casualty, but by careful history, many of these individuals will have had other unrecognized seizures in the past. And this is actually a huge issue, that there are people out there right now, I can guarantee you, in Ireland and in other communities, in Scotland, in the United States, um, who are having recurrent often simple partial seizures, but maybe complex partial seizures, where they're having very unpleasant epigastric sensations, feelings of panic, of worry, and they're actually seizures and nobody knows. The individual themselves actually don't know often. They may, their family may play it down, or it may not be communicated to the family, or the, the GP may not understand it. The person may be referred to a gastroenterologist, believe it or not, and have a scope, and that's normal. But there are a group, there are people out there right now with active epilepsy, and we don't know about it. And I think this is actually something that the epilepsy organizations need to think about. We need to think about it as, um, as professionals, but I think that the patient organizations should think about it again, about whether there's scope for, uh, for some sort of um, educational campaign. It's tricky, but it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, epilepsy may have significant consequences in terms of adverse educational, vocational, and psychosocial functioning. The, one of the obvious ones, of course, being driving, or driving restrictions and somebody's not seizure-free. And also, the epilepsies have consequences in terms of physical mor morbidity, burns, fractures, shoulder dislocation, etc., and also potential mortality, for example, in, in SUDEP, related to SUDEP, and people who have uncontrolled epilepsy with frequent convulsions. And this is, these comments especially refer to the one-third of individuals on the average who have unfortunately drug-resistant epilepsy. They've been on a number of variety of drugs, but they continue to have seizures. And of course, it's important to point out it's not it's not that you, one shouldn't be on a drug because uh, you may still have active epilepsy and be on drugs and be frustrated by your situation, but if you weren't on uh, medications, things would be much better, much worse, excuse me. And, and uh, the medications can be quite good for lots of people in controlling convulsions, but they can be less good in controlling the partial seizures where you become unaware but you don't, it doesn't go into a convulsion. But it's really important not uh, to change your medication uh, without medical advice. Okay, um, this evening we're going to hear new developments in epilepsy surgery, including p potentially robotics. It's a very, we, were, we just spent the last two and a half days at, at a, the um, Irish and British uh, ILA meeting over in Clontarf Castle. It's a fantastic meeting, and there's been lots of new, new, new stuff going on in epilepsy. One of the stuff that I find amazing is robotic uh, technology in the operating room, and maybe Mr. Quigley will refer to that, and also new, new uh, device technologies to treat epilepsy. Um, we'll hear a lot from uh, Professor Goldstein on um, genomics and genetics in understanding uh, in advancing our understanding and advancing our diagnosis and treatment of the epilepsies. 
By the way, just in case you get confused, genetics and genomics are essentially interchangeable. They, they mean the same thing. It's just that the genomics part refers to us thinking about the whole, the, the whole, all of the DNA of an individual rather than one single gene, which is kind of genetics. But essentially, they're interchangeable. And also we're going to hear uh, finally from uh, John Paul Leach about the evolving understanding of the approach to epilepsy management before and during pregnancy. And before is probably more important than during, so John Paul will trash that out later. Remember, and I say this uh, to the host doctors and students, there is no rule in epilepsy that cannot be broken. I'm asked, well, what's, if A thought, you know, what, what's the, What's the situation in this particular <coughs> Every rule in epilepsy can be broken, okay? So just think about that. Every clinical rule in epilepsy can be broken. Um, somebody can be doing everything that right, to getting their sleep, uh, avoiding alcohol, taking their medications regularly, and all the, doing all the things that they're being told to do, uh, are advised to do, and they continue to have seizures. Very, very frustrating. Um, a woman on Valproate, which is a horrend we, we now recognize as a bad drug to be on an epilepsy, can have a perfectly normal baby, okay? Uh, there's a drug called Tegretol that's not supposed to be used in a condition called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, but some people do very well with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and Tegretol. There is no rule in epilepsy that cannot be broken. And this was said by a famous Irish neurologist who came from the States and then went back to the States because he probably couldn't hack it anymore, uh, Harry Lee Parker, who is a fantastic neurologist apparently and who practiced in Ireland in the 1950s. No matter what the future holds, the clinical consultation and being able to try, being able to communicate with each other is extremely important. I'm not going to read everything that's on the slide, but there's no point in having all this fancy technology and Mr. Quigley uh, advising his colleagues in the OR to do all the robotics if we don't communicate with patients and do the right thing. It's fairly obvious, but you know, no matter what happens in the future, all this newfangled technology, we have to be able to communicate with one another doctor and patient. It's also, you've got a responsibility in terms of communication, in terms of, you know, seizure, seizure frequency and medication changes and leaving us know about side effects. But, but all this is important and this is not going to change. In fact, I would argue that the basics are going to become more and more important rather than less uh, important. I've had a patient ask me uh, a couple of weeks ago, doctor, can, can, should I now, are we at the stage now where I should have a whole body MRI scan? So I just shook my head and said, well, why would you need a whole body MRI scan? Okay, we can talk to each other and decide what needs to be done. But common sense is more important than ever, okay? All right. Um, and there's also no point in talking about all this newfangled technology that you hear about in a minute, uh, if we don't have the resources, if people are still waiting to see neurologists, we don't have a national epilepsy centre like they have in Scotland, for example. Uh, John Paul would be familiar with very familiar with couriers. Uh, we don't have such a centre. We don't have a shell font, and I still think it's a it's a it's a crying shame that we don't have a, a national centre for for epilepsy per se. Um, new advances need to be affordable, and although there it certainly has to be recognised that there have been improvements in neurology and epileptology care in Ireland in the last ten years and the government have put some extra funding into it, we're still the bottom of the league. We're still, whatever, who's, who's the bottom of the premiership at the moment? We're still the West Ham of, 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 of European neurology in terms of resources and number of specialists, including number of specialists per capita. We're probably better in terms of uh, nurse specialists, I should say, and, and I should recognise and, and acknowledge that. After one sees an individual with uh, epilepsy or suspected epilepsy, or what we might embody as epilepsy and related disorders, uh, and after we take a, a, a clinical history, the two main tests that still, no, again, no matter what about all the, the new technology, are good quality MRI read by somebody who knows what they're looking at, that sounds fairly obvious, but, and uh, a, a routine EEG studies. They would still be the mainstay tests, okay? We are now moving into genetic testing, where we're beginning to want to look for potential, possible, probable, definite changes in somebody's DNA structure that alters the structure of the protein that the, that the gene makes, that then alters some function in the, in the brain that uh, contributes to seizure predisposition. And also we're looking, beginning to look at genetic changes that might 
uh, help us pick individual drugs or avoid drugs that we feel an individual may be at a much higher risk of side effects if we use a particular drug. So again, uh, David will be telling us a little bit more about where we're, the exciting uh, times we are and the, the exciting times we had we, ahead, we believe, in, in terms of genetic and genomic testing. And as I said, set, those terms are essentially interchangeable. Um, in our own little corner of the universe here in Ireland, um, we have just, in, in this, this year, been uh, approved or picked by the, the, the health service executive, the state, if you like, and Richard Corbridge, who's the... Um, who's the uh, chief information officer with the HSE, to be what, what they're designating. We didn't, we didn't use, pick this, uh, invent this language, but he designates as a lighthouse project. So this has picked three conditions. Uh, it's um, uh, haemophilia, uh, manic depressive disorder, and the epilepsies as a lighthouse project. And this involves a number of angles. It's been... Um, led by a number of people, including Mary Fitzsimons, who's uh, helped uh, or has been main lead in the epilepsy electronic patient record over the years. Uh, from the epilepsy point of view, the Lighthouse Project will recruit 50 children and their parents for genetic testing and for other uh, uh, engagement, if you like, with, 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 the, with the healthcare providers, which I'll just mention in a, sec in a second. Obviously, that should be with severe epilepsy. And we're also going to recruit 50 adults of, with epilepsy associated with intellectual disability of unknown cause. And what we're going to do, uh, this is a 3P epilepsy care project, if you like. Everybody likes all sorts of fancy acronyms these days, so I'll play along with it. So it's um, precision medicine, and that's the genomics part. And what we will try and do in these 100 individuals is we will try and find a molecular or uh, genetic diagnosis in a, in a proportion of these individuals, we would expect on current state of knowledge that maybe we will find a genetic cause of these individuals' epilepsy in perhaps 15 or 20 percent. That will remain to be seen. We're also going to uh, allow the parents and the carers to be able to access their own electronic patient record so they can report back to us on what's happening with their epilepsy. And then we're going to be able to uh, interrogate a lot of the EPR data in terms of uh, trying to uh, get further insight into into the into epilepsy in Ireland. This is just a, a really a pilot project, and we're getting we're getting signals that if it's successful, it'll obviously be supported in a more substantive way. But uh, it's not often that the government comes to you and says, "Here, we're going to give you money to do this project." So it's it's really good and it's really welcome. Um, and the, the the whole idea being, wouldn't it, this is our a, a, a patient electronic patient record. Um, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to um, click on the data that the patient or family has entered or, or click on the uh, evolving new genetic data in a particular <coughs> patient? And that's kind of the goal, uh, to integrate all this information into the patient's electronic uh, patient record. Um, we have lots of drugs for epilepsy, not, obviously not going to go through them. Um, by the way, I should, it reminds me that... Um, if any of you, and it'll probably be a small number in the audience, but if any of you are on a drug called um, ritigabine, which is Trobot, uh, which is a, a drug that was developed, well, I won't go into it, but is now owned by uh, a, a major pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, for reasons that I won't, won't get into, uh, GSK have decided to take this drug off the world market by June 2017. I... I disagree with it. Obviously, a lot of my colleagues disagree with it. Um, and they sh Anyway, we won't get into the rights and wrongs of it, but the point is if you're on Trobot, you will have to discuss with your doctor sooner rather than later in terms of safely coming off it. And the difficulty is that anybody who's been on Trobot, by definition, probably has fairly refractory epilepsy. There may not be a lot of choices, but um, it's just something to highlight to the patient group. If you're on Trobot, go, go to your doctor sooner rather than later. Uh, there's still advances in, in drug treatment. It is becoming more difficult for pharma to do the cl traditional clinical trials, again, for reasons which I, I won't necessarily go into, but one obvious reason being that if you've got potentially 20 drugs for epilepsy, then your treating neurologist does not necessarily want to give you a placebo after failing three or four drugs because he's got a lot, he or she has got a lot of other choices. So it is becoming more difficult to do the traditional uh, drug trials. The latest drug on the market is a drug called Riveracetam, Riviat. 
Uh, it's actually not, it's approved in Ireland. It's, a, it's approved and available in a lot of other jurisdictions. It's, a, it's an analogue or a chemical first cousin of Keppra, a drug that many of you will be familiar with. But Breviact has been approved for the treatment of focal epilepsy in Ireland. Uh, but it's currently, a, they're currently wrangling about financial issues between the company and, and the state about, uh, about uh, getting, through this, getting this through the long-term illness scheme and how much, how much uh, the company are going to be paid for it. That's none of our business, but hopefully it's going to be sorted fairly soon. Um, but it is, it is a new advance, and it is not just a, we, we would hope that it's not just a, a Me Too Kepra, but time will, time will tell. There's a lot of interest, excuse me, in cannabidiol for the treatment of epilepsy, including uh, severe childhood epilepsy, a variety of severe childhood ep uh, epilepsies. And thankfully, I don't have to discuss that now because Colin Doherty is going to give a fantastic talk about this in the morning. And Colin knows everything about cannabidiol, and he's going to tell you everything tomorrow. And there's other, t uh, other drugs in development. I I'm going to finish up. A couple of other things. There is ongoing interest in the community about seizure prediction, but I, I, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a, an interest of some uh, epileptology centres in, in the world, including a number of centres in the United States, including at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, Gavin is going to tell us about devices, so I'll leave that to Gavin. And of course, technology uh, myself and John Paul were giving out about emails earlier on, but uh, technology, of course, like everything else in, in the universe, has its good points and its bad points. But we are, and ye are as patients, using technology, apps, seizure apps, alarms, um, fantastic, lots of technology out there that I can't keep up with. I think probably Geraldine from Epilepsy Ireland is probably the country's expert, uh, and maybe Sinead Murphy, one of our epilepsy nurses. Um, also, just to remember that epilepsy is more than just seizures, particularly in individuals with chronic refractory, uh, difficult to control epilepsy. And again, a lot of you will be aware of these problems. And I think, as, again, the community, as in the epileptology community worldwide, are, are more interested in these comorbidities than they have been. And I think that's obviously a very good thing. An example would be bone health related to some medications. Um, and I don't think we should forget holistic appro approaches. In, in Western medicine in general, there's increasing interest in Eastern practice of wellness, mindfulness, you've all heard of it, and, and people are studying this now in, in chronic disease, including uh, epilepsy. And I think we should be certainly open, uh, I'm totally open to uh, looking at these holistic approaches in the form of integrated uh, medicine. And finally, who, uh, not David, because he'd probably know, but, uh, and what, what's this? And finally, what is this? Pardon? Yeah, so it's, a, it's like there's a huge amount of money currently being invested by Google, by Tesla Motors, trying to inve uh, 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 develop uh, self-driving cars. And even people saying that in whatever 20 years' time, humans should be banned from driving cars because humans just make mistakes and they get tired. And so, yeah, But it's, it's also a fascinating area for epilepsy because if you could imagine in the future that there were self-driving cars with very safe technology that... If you had epilepsy, generally you wouldn't necessarily have to be seizure-free to, 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 to drive around in a car, to get your computer to drive around in the car. So it's, it's a fascinating area. Um, the basic clinical method will remain unchanged and become more important than ever. Always a challenge of resources in Ireland. Always, uh, you know, when, you're, when your politicians come knocking at the door, you'll have a chat with them. Uh, don't expect a huge change overnight. All of this is the slow drip drip of progress, okay? And that's, that's just the nature of what, what it is. There are sometimes sea change, significant changes, but usually it's more, it's more slow. And we'll hear uh, about some of the main changes that are, are, are kind of on the way right now and um, in, in junior medicine and surgical and device technology. And with that, I am going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Gavin Quigley, to tell us about uh, updated advances in epilepsy surgery and devices. Thank you, Gavin.